Welcome back, everybody, to the second half of the lecture on gas particle partitioning. I'm Dr. Lisa. And uh, so here we're going to talk about the theory behind gas particle partitioning. And it has to do with adsorption versus absorption, which uh, we talked about a little bit in the absorption lecture. And adsorption with a D is where the chemical sits on the surface of some, you know, two-dimensional thing. Oops, sorry. I'm trying to get my pointer to work here correctly. My pen, here we go. Yeah, sitting on the surface of a two-dimensional, or it's a three-dimensional object, but they're sitting on a 2D surface. And then absorption with a B is where the chemical can actually penetrate into the center of this three-dimensional matrix. And this has important implications. The, the, the mechanism of, of absorption has important implications for how the chemical is going to behave. So if we're not sure whether it's adsorption or absorption, we just call it sorption. And um, wow, why is this not displaying correctly? It's a shocker. There we go. All right, so here's the um, the some of the theory behind it. This guy, Jim Panko, I actually, I believe he's still alive. Um, Jim Panko is a really interesting guy if you ever hear him speak. He was a long time smoker and um, he had cancer in his larynx and had to have his larynx taken out and so he has to speak through one of those um, like electrical voice box things and uh, he's pretty pissed about it and so he kind of went after the, <laughs> went after this the the whole tobacco establishment and did a lot of work on understanding gas particle partitioning because that has to do with how uh, nicotine gets delivered to your system when you smoke so very interesting. Anyway, he said that, look, we can we can describe our partitioning by, by um, defining this thing we'll call Kp, which is our gas particle partitioning coefficient. And it's the concentration of the chemical in the particle phase. So that would be like um, nanograms of chemical per cubic meter of air. And also Cg here divided by the concentration of the chemical in the gas phase, which is also, sorry, sorry ah, I got my units backwards. Concentration of the particle phase would be like nanograms of chemical per gram of particle. And concentration in the gas phase would be nanograms of chemical per cubic meter of air. And so you can see how, you know, you got uh, nanograms per gram here and nanograms per cubic meter here. Your units are all messed up. So you need to have the total suspended particulate, the, the amount of particles, the grams of particles per cubic meter of air to make all the units cancel out so that Kp will be dimensionless. And then using this Kp value, <coughs> excuse me, he said, look, I can come up with a couple of equations that would explain how this works if you have an adsorption mechanism and also if you have an absorption mechanism. And we'll revisit these, these equations in a minute. Uh, but the important thing to notice about them right now is that they both involve using the hypothetical subcooled liquid vapor pressure of the chemical, or the, maybe not, you know, the liquid vapor pressure. And if the chemical is a solid, then you have to use the hypothetical. Um, so <clears throat> you should be able to describe gas particle partitioning by using um, the vapor pressure. But Jim Panko also recognized that if absorption within a three-dimensional matrix is important, then octanal air partition coefficient might be a better descriptor. So you could also, uh, for absorption, write an equation where Kp is a function of KOA. <clears throat> and then there's all these other things going on, things like the um, fraction of organic matter on your particles, because you know some of the particles in the atmosphere could be sand, for example, that have almost no organic matter. Uh, then you got your molecular weight of your organic matter compared to the molecular weight of octanol because we're using octanol air partition coefficient. So we need to sort of correct for the fact that the, the organic matter on the particles is not octanol. And then here's the activity coefficient of the chemical in octanol and the activity coefficient of the chemical in the organic matter, which like we know that, right? Uh, and then you have the density of octanol here and a little thing here just to convert units. So it's a little crazy because we don't know. I mean, we don't know these, and we also don't know the molecular weight of the organic matter. So a lot of this is a guessing game, but but you get it. The theory is there, and the theory says that you can use KOA as a descriptor. Okay, so adsorption, you can imagine uh, absorption with a B was as absorbing inside, dissolving inside some three-dimensional matrix. And we've dealt with that kind of thing. You know, that's that's the equilibrium partitioning. We've dealt with that with like octanol water partitioning, That that's fine. Adsorption is where you have, uh, where your chemical is sitting down on the surface of something. And that's different because you might have a limited amount of surface area. 
and also the same mass of particles has a very different total surface area depending on the size of the particles. You know, one big particle has a relatively small surface area. Millions of tiny particles have a huge amount of surface area, but they all might weigh a gram, right? So the mass of the particle is not what's important. What's important is the total surface area. And so you can describe this using basically a Langmuir isotherm, and you get an equation that looks something like this, where phi is the... Uh, the partitioning, it's the concentration of the chemical, the ratio of the, the concentration of the chemical in the particle phase to that of the gas phase. And it's equal to this, you know, sort of a uh, constant, whatever you want to call it, kind of like a Langmuir constant. B times the concentration of the gas phase over one plus B times the concentration of the gas phase. And it's the, you know, BC over one plus BC, that's what gives it the curvature, right? This is like a Langmuir isotherm, and so it's got the curvature to it. And so the, the point is that as your, the concentration of your chemical goes up, the absorption doesn't continue linearly. It will at some point kind of level off because you've just run out of sites onto which the chemical can absorb. So the surface area of the particles is important, and we could express that as cubic centimeters, excuse me, square centimeters of surface area per cubic centimeter of particle. I know that's kind of odd. Wrap your head around that for a minute. But here we're, we're, we're expressing this. This is the basically the amount of surface area available. And phi, again, is the amount that's absorbed. And these are all sort of isopleths of saying, you know, this is how much is absorbed. Uh, and here's the, the pressure in different um, units, it's in millimeters of mercury. But basically, as the pressure... So let's see, this is the amount absorbed. We have 100% absorbed when you have compounds that have very low vapor pressure. So this is low vapor pressure. And then these are things with high vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is increasing as you go this direction. Uh, and so, and then these are lines of iso vapor pressure, right? Everything on this line has the same vapor pressure, but the phi here, sorry, this is theta. Theta is changing. They're, they go kind of crazy with their phi's and their thetas. Don't pay too much attention to that, but the point is the amount of surface area available. As the amount of surface area available increases, then the amount of the chemical that's adsorbed onto the surface will increase because there's more surface available, so more of the chemical ends up there. Uh, and at some point we end up at 100% everything absorbed to the particles, but that's again going to be a function of the vapor pressure of the chemical. Things with low vapor pressure are going to need a lot of particles to get there. Uh, excuse me, things with high vapor pressure are going to lead a lot of, of surface area to get there. Things with low vapor pressure get there relatively quickly. So going back to a uh, similar idea here, if we look at the this kind of uh, same way, different way of saying the same thing. So here in this plot, we have phi, which is the, the fraction on the particles, and now we have log of vapor pressure. And the, the different isopleths here are increasing TSP, increasing total suspended particulate. And again, you can see uh, if you've got a low vapor pressure down here, then almost all of your chemical is absorbed, even if you only have a small amount of particles. But for chemicals with high vapor pressures, they need a lot of TSP going this direction. They need a lot of TSP for them to end up absorbed. Okay. Bye. It's weird because my two screens are out of sync. There we go. Okay, temperature dependence of, um, of gas particle partitioning. So here is basically Kp right here. This is Kp. And then this is 1 over temperature times 10 to the third in inverse Kelvin. Uh, and basically you see, you know, a negative slope to this line, right? So remember, this is 1 over T. So if we go this direction, it's cold. And if we go this direction, it's hot, right? So at high temperatures, the, the pH and the vapor pressure is going to be high. So Kp will be high over here. Uh, and the amount of chemical in the, in the um, particle phase will be... <laughs> I'm so confused. Yeah. The amount of chemical in the vapor phase goes down as the temperature goes down. So that's why this has a negative slope. Okay, and, and we could describe this just by using a linear regression. Uh, but the point here is that the, the uh, temperature dependence is pretty strong because it's like Henry's Law or vapor pressure where it takes a lot of energy to, to get something from a condensed phase, i.e. sticking to a particle, to go into the gas phase. So gas particle partitioning is very sensitive to temperature. 
in the hot summer months, you know, you got a lot of gas phase contaminants, but in the cold winter, most things are going to stick to particles and settle out quickly. So generally speaking, things are not going to travel as far in the winter as they do in the summer. And uh, by the way, when we define the term semi-volatile, what we mean is that the compound has a significant concentration in the both the gas and particle phases, meaning you can measure it in both the gas and particle phases. If you can't really measure it in the particle phase, then you just call it volatile. And if you can't measure it in the gas phase, you call it non-volatile. But when it has, has a little bit in both phases, you call it semi-volatile. All right, so uh, again, Panko had this big, ugly equation for explaining what happens to Kp. And it's a function of, of the subcooled liquid vapor pressure. Uh, and the point of this slide is just that all this other stuff could probably be assumed to be constant. And so you could just linearize this. You get a nice straight line, log of Kp equals some slope times the log of vapor pressure plus an intercept. And Pankow, looking at this equation, suggested that at equilibrium, this slope should be minus one. And oddly, in the same token, so that was adsorption, but for ab absorption, you get the same thing, right? Kp is a function of vapor pressure. You can, again, these things can all be assumed to be constant. So you can linearize it. <clears throat> and looking at all this information, Pankow also suggested that the slope should be minus one at equilibrium. And so it doesn't really help you to know what the slope is. To, it won't help you figure out whether you're looking at absorption or adsorption because the slope will be minus one regardless. So here's some examples, log of Kp. This is actually normalized to the fraction of organic chemistry, to, for, fraction of organic carbon. But here it's just plain old log Kp, log Kp, different locations. This is Beaverton and this is Iowa. I forget where they are. Is that Oregon? Beaverton, Oregon, I think. Um, yeah, Beaverton, Oregon. There it is right there. Yay. Okay. Um, so two different locations and just looking at the same data but normalizing it two ways. One is just straight log Kp and the other is Kp divided by FOC. And it does, you can see these lines are relatively far apart, but when you normalize them to FOC, these lines now are much closer together. So that makes sense that, um, that perhaps uh, FOC is a, is a driving force here in determining what's happening to the gas particle partitioning. And then finally, in this, this is, you know, getting kind of old now, 2002, but, but Mater and Pankow uh, basically looked at this like every way they could think of. They tried calculating Kp and plotting it versus um, vapor pressure, versus log of vapor pressure. Uh, they, pro they tried Kp normalized to FOM, fraction of organic matter. They tried Kp normalized to the fraction of organic carbon. They tried Kp normalized to the amount of elemental carbon, EC. And they tried Kp normalized to both FOC plus FEC, organic carbon and elemental carbon. And I think the point here is just that you get the best agreement, you get the best R squared when you normalize to both organic and elemental carbon um, for, for PAHs here, for PAHs. For dioxins, it's kind of a toss up. You get some good results when you just normalize to EC, uh, but you also get some good results when you normalize to both. Uh, and if you're looking at PAHs and dioxins all in the same regression, the best uh, result here was to normalize to both organic carbon and elemental carbon. So this is an argument for why they think both organic carbon and elemental carbon are important sorbents for chemicals on particles in the atmosphere. Now, we just had that conversation about how these slopes should be minus one. And by the way, look at here, minus one, minus one, minus one, all very, very close to minus one. Okay, so at equilibrium, right? But then there was an experiment, this is a little bit older, this is Matt Simsek, uh, his PhD dissertation, I think this was, where they uh, were taking samples in the city of Chicago, those are the dark uh, symbols, and then also out over Lake Michigan. And even though it takes the air, you know, three and a half hours roughly of travel time to go from Chicago out to their site in Lake Michigan, and the concentration dropped by a third, Kp and the slopes didn't change, and notice that the slopes are not one. But if they're not changing, then you must be at equilibrium. So they were making the argument that it is possible to be at equilibrium even when the slopes are not minus one. And that's all I really wanted to say about gas particle partitioning. Just want you to understand that it is a function of things like the amount of organic carbon, the amount of elemental carbon in the system. It's a function of um, 
the temperature and wind speed, not, not wind speed, temperature and vapor pressure of the chemical, and also to some extent the relative humidity, because um, lots of atmospheric particles are hygroscopic, which means they will suck moisture out of the air, and that will affect their properties.